half human. Wild men capture our collective imagination. The likes of the Yeti, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, and other Orang Pandex, almost human beasts, are the stuff of folklore. And as a kid, I loved monsters because it, they're scary, you know, and you want to know what's out there. Um, but as I grew up to an adult, I wanted to know the truth behind it. But this particular myth is interesting teams of scientists all over the world who are betting on the existence of the Yeti. You cannot have so many people over such a long time seeing something if it doesn't exist. On their quest for the Yeti, a Danish and British team is searching for the mysterious ape man in Asia. From the morphology of the hairs, there's no doubt that there's an unknown species of primate waiting to be discovered in Sumatra. And on the other side of the Atlantic, an American team, financed by a Canadian millionaire who is also a Yeti hunter, stands to obtain more rapid results thanks to a series of DNA analyses. For some, this analysis is revolutionary. For others, it is suspect. More recently, an English and Swiss team have also taken on the challenge. The first results caused a sensation in the media. Who will race to publish a major discovery? Is this quest a serious one? And who are the researchers prepared to invest time and money in such a controversial subject? In 1955, a French expedition climbed Mount Makalu in the Himalayas. En route, they noticed strange prints in the snow. Several photographs of this type toured the world. And the legend of the Yeti, our favorite monster, was born. As there was no proof of his existence, the Yeti quickly joined UFOs and ghosts and flourished in people's fantasies and imaginations. The abominable snowman of the Himalayas. You've heard of but everything changed in 2004 when the prestigious scientific journal Nature declared the Yeti worthy of belonging to the realm of science. The starting point was the discovery in Indonesia of the skeletons of a now extinct human species, Flores Man nicknamed Hobbit on account of its small stature, standing at just over one meter tall and weighing in at around 20 kilos. But more intriguing still is that this hominid lived between 100 and 10,000 BC, in other words, in parallel to our own species, Homo sapiens, and so was a contemporary cousin of ours. If this phenomenon could hold true for Flores Man, as affirmed in the highly reputable magazine Nature, the Yeti could also be a prehistoric man except that, unlike Flores, Neanderthal man, or Homo erectus, he may not necessarily have disappeared. This new approach to the mystery of the wild man is based on a new conception of our origins. We are in the Gallery of Comparative Anatomy in the Natural History Museum of Paris. It is by comparing and classifying species, what we call systematics, trying to establish an ordered vision of nature, that we first understood there were groups of species that resembled each other more than others. The image we had up until very recently, even in paleontology and even in the 20th century, was the pattern of evolution leading up to man, you know, the procession of animals gradually becoming upright. This was an extremely linear and progressive vision of the pattern of human evolution. In the 1990s, a tree of life conception of evolution was established, which shows that there is no final stage ending with man, but rather lots of experiences in Africa and also in Asia. We now know that specific groups evolved in a vast tree-like manner. This is the main difference introduced by the notion of the tree of life theory. We know today that the human species underwent intense perfusion during millions of years. Numerous potential cousins and ancestors have been discovered that overhaul many of our certitudes concerning our biological origins. The most intriguing result of this being that as little as a few tens of thousands of years ago, several human species shared the Earth. We know about Neanderthal man, discovered in 1857, and Flores man, discovered in 2004, and in 2010, there was a new twist, 
when DNA analysis on a piece of bone found in a cave in southern Russia proved the existence of Denisova hominins, a human species whose appearance had been unknown up until then. Given that we now know all this is extremely recent, might we not find, in some region of the world, that Homo sapiens might have neglected for any number of reasons the relics or the vestiges of these men of the past who persist in people's memories and in legends all over the world? Could the Yeti be the survivor of an ancient species that should have disappeared? This is the only theory that would lift him out of the realm of legend and into the real world. In a sign that the Yeti has become more credible, certain prestigious scientific institutions, like the Lausanne Museum of Zoology in Switzerland, have opened their doors to him. Well, here we are in front of a rather empty display case, which is the one dedicated to the Yeti in our museum. There's not much in there, as you can see. We don't know, but perhaps in the future, it will contain the remains of the real Yeti found by scientists. For now, it's more of a nod to the Yeti. We're entirely aware of the fact that, until proof of the contrary, the Yeti remains an imaginary animal. But we're keeping the door open. We're entertaining a glimmer of hope that one day this display case will be filled up. Will we one day see a Yeti in a museum display case among well-known animals? The highly reputable Lausanne Museum is today specializing in Yeti research due to the fact that 10 years ago it acquired the archives of the late Bernard Uvelmans, a zoologist. Not only did Bernard Uvelmans dare to believe in the Yeti, he also affirmed loud and clear that it was none other than Neanderthal man. At the time, he was violently rejected by the scientific community. But all that has changed since the recent discoveries of Florence. Tens of thousands of documents collected by Bernard Ruvelmans are now the focus of unprecedented interest on the part of scientists. These documents constitute, in a way, the starting point for the new worldwide scientific quest for the Yeti. The archive boxes concerning the Yeti, or the Yetis, are divided into different regions. North America, so here you have everything relating to the Sasquatch, or Bigfoot, and here you have the European zone, with Neanderthal man. The Siberian regions, with the Yeti and other Almasti. And then lower down, the Oriental zone, with the Orang Pendek of Indonesian origin. He amassed this collection of 25 to 30,000 documents over a period of 50 years. The boxes are rather full, rather packed, and inside them are piles of documents about the wild and hairy man, which is the generic name he gave to all these men, yetis and others. For example, this print of an enormous, apparently human footprint belonging to an unknown being, perhaps a gigantopithecus. This footprint comes from a clay soil in the Tian Shan. Bernard Uvelmans was a pioneer in his field. It was he who invented the term cryptozoology, the study of hidden animals. An intellectual swindle for some, a simple branch of zoology for others, the discipline has always been the object of intense controversy. When the leading figures in French zoology in the 1970s discussed things with Hevelmans, they would speak about the existence of the Yeti, saying, go on, continue, don't give up, you're on the right track. But in public, things were a little different. Hevelmans archives have now become highly precious, and a renowned expert, British professor of genetics Brian Sykes from the University of Oxford, teamed up with the Museum of Lausanne in May 2012 in pursuit of the Yeti. Their first objective was to gather credible samples. We published a press release in the form of an appeal to the international community saying, look, in a nutshell, things are as follows. 
The controversy surrounding the Yeti is not about to disappear. So what we propose is that you give us your samples. If you've got samples of Yeti hair, entrust them to us, and we'll subject them to a new technique of genetic molecular analysis. We'll then finally be able to see whether we can determine a living being that could lead people to believe that a Bigfoot, a Yeti, or a Sasquatch exists. We'll see. Michel Sartori and Brian Sykes are starting from scratch, so to speak. They are waiting for samples to arrive before they can start work. In the meantime, teams elsewhere in the world have already gone a step further and for a long time now have been studying hairs that have been attributed to the Yeti. This is the case for scientists in Copenhagen. Their major strength is that they are already experts in scientific research on hair. Professor Thomas Gilbert's team invented a technique of genetic analysis that enabled the DNA sequencing of a mammoth that died 50,000 years ago from just one single hair. We have done a lot of work on hair. We, we did, um, uh, my colleagues and I did some early papers on the use of sort of very, very degraded hairs to get genetic information in both the sort of anthropological, archaeological and forensic context. Our aim is simply to do an open um, analysis and give the results that we find. It has special in that way that it's very hard. It's, it's something that doesn't break down very easily. When it grows out on our head, it will take out cells and DNA with it. And when it grows out, the hair then, in a way, protects a, a possible cell core and DNA in a shell of creatine. And you can find from hair the entire genome of the organism that sourced the hair. With one hair, we can do everything. This team has already analyzed several potential Yeti hairs that have turned out to come from dogs or horses. But for Thomas Gilbert, it is important to carry out such tests, even if they run the risk of being marginalized in the scientific community. There are a lot of people out there who want to believe in the existence of these, we say, cryptic hominids, you know, whether it's Bigfoot or the Yeti. Um, people often ask me, why do I even you know, get involved in this? If I'm a, a credible scientist, why do I dabble in, in the area of cryptozoology? And, but, you know, there are new species of uh, primates being discovered. Right? There was one just a few years ago, and that does show that even when we think we know everything, there are still things out there. Analyzing unidentified hair is therefore a key method in the Yeti hunt. But in the absence of samples, or as a complement to them, footprints are also the object of a specialized area of scientific research, ichnology. Used in the field of paleontology for a long time already, Ichnology delivers astonishing results in the quest for the wild men. One of the leading experts in ichnology is the primatologist David Chivers from the prestigious University of Cambridge in England. He has supervised field research on gibbons and on orangutans in Malaysia and Indonesia. For a decade now, he has been studying a legendary wild man from Sumatra known as Orang Pendek, in other words, the small man. It was certain prints that finally convinced Professor Shivers of the existence of a potential Indonesian Yeti. What supported the credibility were the reports by Dutch people in the area, going back 1920s, and probably the local people before that, of the same phenomenon. It was a bit boring sticking to proven science. What makes it more interesting are topics like this around the edge that are not substantiated. But uh, one only talks about it because one believes it will be substantiated. These footprints are amazing. The curved heel is unique. We call it banana foot. We kept these copies. The main archive is in the Natural History Museum down in London. When we look at these pictures of the other hominoids, apes and humans, we see this embraces a unique mixture. The big toe is short and at an angle like the orangutan. It's digit, but they're more or less the same length across. And in this sense, is like the humans. I think the fact that it walks bipedally is upright makes it look like humans. It really is something between a orangutan and a gibbon. Historically, the Orang Pendek is one of the strongest candidates for the status of living Yeti. 
numerous professional teams, but also many amateurs, artists, and fascinated followers are on its trail. Even if the orang pendek is an evolved species of orangutan that has evolved to walk on two legs, I still think that's really important because the time frame we would have had to evolve is so short that we could learn so much even regardless of what it is. Yeah, I think when I make them, it's, I, it's not, for me anyway, it's not just a piece of work that I have no emotional attachment to. I think I put a lot of my thoughts and emotions and the idea that something like that still exists, it kind of has that excitement around it made me excited about it and made me want to go and look for it. <laughs> These enthusiasts are often passed off as kindly crackpots. For many, they have as much credibility as UFO hunters or ghostbusters. The problem is that no scientific institution is prepared to seriously invest in researching field samples of wild men. And so, it falls to the enthusiasts to carry out the mission. One of the most famous of these enthusiasts is Richard Freeman. He has already been to Sumatra four times and has even written a book on the Orang Pendic. Cryptozoologists do what they do to discover things. We're not interested in preserving the mystery or the mystique of anything. We want to know the truth. We want to know what's over that next hill. We want to know what's in the depths of the jungle, in the depths of the seas. We want to find these creatures and study them. So it's a life of adventure. Today, this cryptozoologist, a professional monster hunter, is preparing his fifth expedition in search of Orang Pendic samples. I think the history of Orang Pendek lies in Sundaland. Now, Sundaland was a massive peninsula that encompasses Malaya, Sumatra, Borneo and Java. Now, about 10,000 years ago, the end of the last ice age, the sea levels dropped and Borneo, Java, Sumatra, Malaya, they all separated. They became islands and a peninsula. Uh, the Bornean orangutans and the Sumatran orangutans were on two different islands. I think the orang pendek is the third species of orangutan, and this one has evolved to live on the forest floor. Zoologists first tried to get moving film of the snow leopard in the early 1970s. It took them six years, six years in the field, before they actually filmed a snow leopard. And we know snow leopards exist. So with an animal like Orang Pendek, you could keep going back again and again and again and never see it. So we need to keep going back. So Richard, the cryptozoologist, and Adele Morse, the artist, are preparing their expedition to Sumatra. They will supply any samples they find to the Copenhagen team for hair analysis. Meanwhile, Michelle Sartori of Lausanne and Brian Sykes from Oxford received their first samples as a result of the appeal launched in media worldwide. The first samples they are supplied with come from the other side of the planet, from North America. There, the wild man is called Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, a gigantic being that allegedly roams the vast forests of the American continent. Bigfoot even has his own reality TV show, which is a huge success. Bigfoot's popularity sells everything and anything. One American citizen in three is convinced he exists. The Bigfoot folklore in North America is, is vast and huge. Uh, Bigfoot has really grown in people's imaginations because you have you know the big the monster coming down. You have Bigfoot. Uh, you have Bigfoot uh, beef jerky. But why does the idea of an encounter with a wild man? capture the collective imagination worldwide. <laughs> We're probably so attracted to the Yeti as he is our double who has escaped civilization. Man does not want to remain alone, which is why he seeks out beings that resemble him, that can serve as a link between the rest of creation, the rest of nature. And at the same time, natural man is good because he is free from social constraints. There is a sort of nostalgia for wildness. Tarzan is liberated. He has lived with the animals, lived in harmony with nature. He is at ease with himself. The general public is fascinated by Bigfoot, and why wouldn't they be? It's a, 
amazing, mysterious, strange creature that many people think are co is coexisting with us. It would be really cool if Bigfoot was real. I would love that. What scientist wouldn't want to study that? But the problem is that the evidence just isn't there. In April 2013, on a road in Florida, amazed drivers observe what they think is a Sasquatch. They photograph it, convinced they're finally documenting proof of the creature's existence. Dozens of photos like this crop up every year, but they are always insufficient proof, as they're suspected of being staged or doctored. To take things further, biological traces must be collected. As elsewhere in the world, American scientists involved in the quest for the Sasquatch are marginalized by their colleagues and do not obtain sufficient funding to lead their own research campaigns. They have to make do with samples that have come from everywhere and nowhere. They rely on private investigators, such as this Canadian millionaire. Here in Canada, Adrian Erickson is the local Bigfoot hunter. A prosperous businessman with a passion for hunting and fishing, for several months of the year he lives at God's Lake, in the middle of the vast Canadian forests. If you take all the people that have seen a Sasquatch and put them all together, you, you'd fill a city. The people of this world deserve to know that there are creatures like this that are not discovered and they exist. So I thought, look it, I'm going to spend the money. I'm going to prove this world that my business was going good then. I'm going to prove to the world that this thing exists. So we thought, hey, if we got better video footage than what we had, than what was out there, which was very little, that would be enough to the scientists to, uh, you know, that should be enough. His extensive financial resources have enabled him to hire a team of scientists and cameramen to search for proofs of the wild man's existence deep in the continent's forest land. Major resources to finally convince the scientific community that the American Yeti exists. My grandpa told me that he saw it. It was like a big man, it was really big, and really big and tall. I want to see it for myself. If I really see it, then I'll believe it. I really believe it. Seeing is believing. The story of the Yeti in a nutshell. The international teams are mobilized. On the one side are the scientists in their laboratories. On the other, for want of a better method, are the Yeti hunters out searching for samples. The British team is launching its fifth expedition in Indonesia in search of the Orang Pendek. Artist Adele Morse and cryptozoologist Richard Freeman are now in Sumatra. The west of this volcano-studded island is considered to be one of the last supposed habitats of the mythical creature. Every year I come back here, there's less and less rainforest, and you can see the, the farmland uh, encroaching on it, and, and there's, more, there's more and more forest disappearing every year and there's a chance Orang Pendek will be extinct before it's even identified. Adele and Richard travel to one of the villages located at the entrance of the Kerensi National Park. Here, the Orang Pendek is far from a stranger. And so the first stage for our monster hunters involves meeting witnesses who claim to have seen the creature. Thank you all very much for coming. I've come all the way, and uh, my colleague, I've come all the way from uh, England to research the Orang Pendek. This is my fifth time here searching for the Orang Pendek and we want to prove that it exists and we want to protect it. So which of you people here have, have seen the Orang Pendek? I saw the Orang Pendek. He had grey fur. He was one meter high and he had big muscles. The Orang Pendek was eating kitan fruits. Why do they feel scared when they see? Because I'd never seen it before. I am not frightened of elephants and tigers, but I'd never seen anything like that. Encounter after encounter, the portrait of the creature becomes clearer.
but before being able to collect any samples, Adele and Richard need a scientific framework for their expedition. They have to sift fact from legend. To help them, they call upon the precious experience of Indonesian primatologist Ahmad Yanwar. In this area, they saw so maybe three until five individuals when they are jumping up on canopy trees. Okay. They said this around Pendek. And the uh, description is uh, the face is similar to an orangutan and the build? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, it's mostly it's, uh, still similar to orangutan, maybe about 60% close to orangutan. As a scientist, do you think the orang pendek exists as a, as a distinct species? Uh, witness uh, described uh, animal is consistent. Orang pendek still exists in some places, but another species maybe they are extinct. Maybe still exists in some place in, in Kerinci Seplat National Park. So quite big area. Richard and Adele set off on the Orang Pendek Trail. The hope of finding proof of the existence of Sumatra's forgotten ape now lies squarely on the shoulders of an artist and a cryptozoologist. Richard and Adele, accompanied by local guides and mountain climbers, will have to climb the belt of dormant volcanoes, behind which they will enter the intact vegetation of the Karensi Sablat National Park, Indonesia's largest nature reserve. They set out with the little they have to hand, without any funding other than their own. Such is the destiny of these yeti hunters on whom, for lack of anything better, the scientists are counting. The pair will try to surprise the Orang Pendik with a few instruments and a few technical notions in the heart of a vast and often hostile nature. It is a veritable act of faith. Their deep-rooted belief far surpasses any rational probability of coming across the beast. But these expeditions are not futile because everybody agrees that it is still possible today to discover a new species. The hope of such a discovery is, after all, the main motivation behind the worldwide quest for the Yeti. After two days of a grueling journey, Adele and Richard reach a remote shore of Lake Guding Tuju, where, according to witnesses, the vast majority of Orang Pendik sightings have occurred. Located at an altitude of over 2,000 meters, this lake formed in a former volcanic crater. The forest that surrounds it has remained untouched for several tens of millions of years. We think Orang Pendek is primarily terrestrial. It spends most of its time on the ground, unlike uh, the known species of orangutan, which are arboreal. So it's going to be feeding on, on fallen fruit, mainly. This is the fruit that the eyewitness said is on the Orang Pendek. It's a very good place to put the camera trap here because there's so many fruit, fallen fruit. Put some bait on the floor, some fruit. And it's motion sensitive. If anything goes past it, it'll take a photograph. Should be night or day. Photos or even videos of the Yeti are the wild man hunter's grail. Because in the absence of a specimen, bones or a body, what scientists refer to as a holotype, the image of a living creature, could change everything. On the other side of the world, our Canadian millionaire Adrian Erickson now has images filmed by his teams in America that have never been viewed before. When we were filming, he agreed to show us some excerpts and to comment on them for the first time. That just shows that, you know, kind of walking by, it's not often you get them in daylight, but, you know, it's just sometimes chance encounters. Unfortunately for him, no institution will take his images seriously. Nothing can be concluded from these distant forms moving around in the forest. Yet in no way discouraged, Adrian Erickson supplies what he declares is the ultimate proof, a close-up. Their eye teeth are a little longer than their, they're more animalistic, but you always see their lips and their tongue are usually dark. And the tongue is, you know, dark colored like a dog's tongue is. But people say that was the 
Chewbacca or something that was used on Star Wars. The images last a few seconds only, and so we cannot verify any single detail. It is impossible not to think the images may have been doctored. The scientific community, they didn't believe they existed anyways, and they just kept raising the bar higher and higher and higher for what they would require from us. So this went on and on, and finally Lila says the only thing that might satisfy them is DNA. Back to Indonesia. For a week now, Richard Freeman and Adele Morse and their assistants have found tracks of almost everything except the Orang Pendek. Scratches of a Sumatran tiger, the footprints of a sun bear, and the skeleton of a taper, complete with intact jaw. But if the large animals seem to be hiding, small ones and insects are very present, sometimes too present, like these thousands of leeches crawling everywhere. In the evening, as night falls, a large cry is heard. Richard is to reproduce. This is no response. The search for samples also depends on the difficult weather conditions. Every day for several hours, torrential rain floods the soil and makes the atmosphere very humid. But Richard and Adele must accomplish their mission. As soon as the rain stops, they continue their hunt. This time, they head towards the area where the strange cries they heard the previous evening seem to be coming. Shortly after they get there, excitement is at a fever pitch. They are convinced an orang pendek passed this way a very short while ago. You can see the prints and you can see the toes very clearly. Left side. Slightly larger than my hand. They have very thick fingers as well. So you've got quite a massive, massive hand there. Our film crew, who've been at their side 24 hours a day for the entire duration of the expedition, is also surprised. Nobody has ventured this far, as there is no trace of human feet or of any recent human presence, and no members of the expedition left the camp the previous day. These prints remain a complete mystery and raise many questions. It's a first success for Richard and Adele. These prints, if they are not the work of some manipulation, are positively intriguing. However, there are many molds of Yeti footprints all over the world, and the scientific community has never taken them seriously. It is therefore crucial for Richard and Adele to find biological samples that can undergo genetic analysis. It's a hair. We have found it within meters of where we found the orang pendek footprint. It could be from an orang pendek, so we're going to take it. By meticulously inspecting the vegetation around the prints, Richard and Adele are going to collect dozens of hairs of varying sizes and colors. Among these samples could be the irrefutable proof of the existence of the orang pendek. They talk in hushed tones, in case the beast is still close by. It's a piece of the kitan fruit, which the orang pendek is supposed to be fond of. It's been chewed, so we saved it in the hope that there's some saliva with DNA in it. We found so much already. I hope we will actually see one, at least see it. Hopefully photograph it. I don't think we'll have got anything unless we're exceptionally lucky. And it will hold its secrets until we get to a computer. There's nothing. Nothing at all. Just us setting it up and coming back to get it. What you need is a, a legion of these things left up for, you know, four or five months. Richard and Adele have not managed to photograph the Orang Pendic, but they do have a cast of a footprint and samples to analyze. 
Now geneticists and primatologists will take over. The first of them is Ahmad Yanwar, an Indonesian primate expert who has supported their expedition from the outset. His analysis is unsettling. Maybe pinja, one, two, three, four. Another thumb here, large, and here like this. Human-like here. Yeah. But it is look like human footprint. Maybe how many did? So not, it's not, it's not like ape. So it is uh, quite bigger than other uh, apes, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I never got footprint like this before. It kind of the langur. We know exactly about what kind of the footprint from langur. We also know exactly uh, kind of the footprint from uh, like uh, macaque. Mm -hmm. And we know exactly about the, what kind of the footprint from the orangutan. But this one, this kind of the, uh, something that's uh, very different with orangutan. And also it's too big for the other primate. The first thing we need to measure length of the track. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, wide of the track. We usually also measure the angle between the edge two that they have. Uh, so uh, how many uh, degree between these two and this uh, two and also this one from this one and this one. So this one will be very useful uh, to identify the difference uh, between individual with another individual. Mm -hmm. In the hand we have a thumb here, but in the foot we have a thumb in front of this. But this one is in the side. I'm feeling happy now, so many people concerned around Pendek interesting to study before, so only me, very, very <laughs> small team to looking for now is so many. It's a start, it's yeah. enough, it's kind of the start of something yeah. to look for other bits yeah. of hair samples yeah. and blood samples. Yeah. In early 2013, almost in parallel, all the teams involved in the race to find the Yeti were able to obtain samples of hair and sometimes even saliva as was the case in America. The laboratories are now in the starting blocks to analyze the DNA contained in the samples. In a few months' time, each researcher will attempt to be the first to publish their results. In Copenhagen, the samples brought back from Sumatra will be analyzed by Professor Thomas Gilbert's teams. In the US, Adrian Erickson is funding analysis in a dozen different laboratories under the direction of Dr. Melba Ketchum, an expert in the genetic identification of animals. Analyses of samples have also started in Oxford and Lausanne. The appeal was rather successful, and we received several dozen samples, mainly from North America, uh, but from Russia too, and Southeast Asia, which corresponds to the areas where these wild and hairy beasts are thought to live. But analyzing Yeti hair is proving to be more complex than previously thought, and publication of the results is continually postponed. In the advert we ran last year, we were a little optimistic regarding the time frame. We thought we'd already have the results in early 2013, but in actual fact, it took a bit more time gathering the samples and getting them to the laboratory. And then the method is not simple. We had to adapt the method to the rather singular samples we had, so we fell behind schedule. In Copenhagen, the Oren Pendix samples begin their journey. Lars Thomas is eager to get hold of them. This biologist is one of the world's experts in the analysis of dander, in other words, fur, hair, and other skin appendages. He will run the initial analysis on the hairs brought back from Sumatra. It's the start of a veritable investigation. Sherlock Holmes could, from one broken match and two footprints, could tell a lot of things about what had happened. And I won't compare myself to Sherlock Holmes, but I like the idea of just from one hair or a scale or a footprint that I can actually say, well, this animal has been here, or there is something strange out there, you have to go and investigate it. I like this mixture of zoology and detective work. Among all the samples brought back from Indonesia during the various expeditions, Lars has identified vegetal fibers, minute mushrooms, human hair, and fur from known mammals, but also this hair, which for him is probably the hallmark of the orang pendek. I'm quite certain that this, this is not an orangutan, it's not a gibbon or any of the other monkeys from Sumatra, and it's not human. And uh, you can see it's a primate because there's these hollow parts, all primates have, have these. But whereas in the orangutan, it's all in one concentrated man in the middle. This is just blobs here and there. 
and you can also see the color is much more intense and that's that's typical for the orange pendant hairs that I've seen. What will be the verdict of Professor Thomas Gilbert's team? Will genetics confirm the existence of an unknown primate in Sumatra? When it arrives at the Copenhagen laboratory, the potential orang pendek hair will be washed and the DNA it contains will be extracted, purified and amplified. It will then be possible to analyze the animal's DNA sequence and to determine the origin of the hair. The entire process will last at least 24 hours and during this time, hopes run high. What I think initially what was interesting about the sample was the hair color, right? They had these short fragments and they were this sort of orangey color that's at least not common to the native people of, of the area. 24 hours later, it's the moment of truth for the potential orang pendek hair. The DNA sequence is now available for analysis. Now it must be compared with the 30,000 sequences of animals that are already classified in the World Gene Bank. And we did our standard DNA analysis. We basically extracted the DNA from the hair. We had a complete identity, 100% match over the region we looked at to human DNA. This led me at the time to the conclusion that it's basically a human. I don't think this hair uh, sample could have come from a human in any way because the structure is all wrong. Human hairs are very characteristic and this one does not look in any way like a human hair. The human DNA that Tom Gilbert and the DNA lab found in the sample could have come from humans. It could have been simple contamination when the hairs were sampled. Uh, somebody forgot to put gloves on or just lose that drop of sweat on the hairs. I wouldn't dream of suggesting that this is evidence for the existence of a new species, the orang pendek. But this is a clear indication that there is something unknown in Sumatra. So who to believe? Is the reddish hair that was found in the jungle a human hair or that of an ape? What's missing from this endeavor to recognize the orang pendek is a set of clear, legible results that experts agree on. In North America, the samples collected by millionaire Adrian Erickson have also revealed their secrets. There, as for the videos and the quest for samples, major funding backed the genetic analysis. No less than 12 independent laboratories, which weren't told that they were looking for a wild man, simultaneously analyzed the samples of hair, saliva, and skin brought back by Erickson's teams. Arguments to enable the Americans to claim irrefutable results. The efforts end up bearing fruit and even had the effect of a thunderbolt on the scientific community in February 2013, for the first time, the genetic proof of the existence of a Yeti was put forward in a lengthy scientific article published by Dr. Melba Ketchum's team. To date, the team is the only one to have published its data. The announcement took place at a press conference in Dallas. We spent five years doing this study. You've heard of the Human Genome Project. What, we did the same thing the Human Genome Project did, except we did it on three samples instead of one. The new technology allows us to uh, sequence efficiently and quickly. Uh, we have th three terabytes of data from three, over the three samples, so about a terabyte of data for each sample. We have footage, this is the remarkable part, of this red female Sasquatch, and I chose to do a color gene for a hair color and she had the red hair gene. And the scientific community has systematically overlooked this, and with all due respect to these otherwise good researchers, I think it's time for them to slow down and take a look at this data set, because we have a sampling distribution of purported Sasquatch DNA that um, answers a lot of unanswered questions. The announcement that Bigfoot is real and that beyond contested video footage, there is now genetic proof of his existence made headline news in the American press. Troubled by the results, numerous geneticists looked into the study. A scientist must be open to everything, even to the existence of a creature measuring two and a half meters that nobody has yet managed to see. I have noticed the prevalence of TV shows like CSI, for example, where you know, people will often get a sample, put it in a machine, and an answer will come out a few minutes later, and everyone will look at it and go, wow, we've, you know, we've got an answer. 
And the problem with genetic testing is it's really not that easy. Biological reality is indeed more complex than TV crime series would have us believe. In each one of our cells, we have not one but two types of DNA. The first is found in the nucleus, nuclear DNA. This form of DNA is the star of medical analysis and forensic scientists. It is transmitted half by the father and half by the mother and contains our entire genetic program. But another, more simple DNA is located in the mitochondria. The mitochondria are small powerhouses that evolve within the cell, supplying it with all the energy it needs to live and breathe. Mitochondrial DNA is only transmitted by the mother to her children. It is thanks to this DNA that historians can trace back a genealogical heritage of one family over dozens of generations. And it is the study of this mitochondrial DNA that has led Dr. Ketchum to some surprising results. Mitochondrial DNA, uh, this is the first thing we did with these samples. And surprisingly enough, all of them tested 100% modern human. We think it is a human hybrid. That is our theory. Human DNA in a Yeti? It is possible if the Yeti is a hybrid. For Dr. Ketchum, one or several women supposedly paired with the unknown primates. The fruit of their union would therefore be Bigfoot, who received the human mitochondrial DNA from his mother. This human DNA would have been transmitted from mother to daughter until today. But geneticists have found an important piece of information in the mitochondria that throws the hybridization theory into question. When you look at mitochondria, you can basically assign it with a probability to a particular, as we say, geographic uh, origin. There are sequences that are diagnostic of Europe, sequences diagnostic of Asia, Africa, the Americas. Bigfoot's found in the Americas. Um, if you look at the results they get, the mitochondrial DNA, you find that they have sequences from not just uh, Americas, but also from Europe and from Africa. Now, this makes no sense at all. Why would a Bigfoot in the Americas have African mitochondrial DNA. This means that these mysterious North American animals have hybridized not just once, but repeatedly with humans all over the world and ended up in, in North America. The idea that Bigfoot apes paired with women from all over the world is considered unrealistic by the scientific community. But despite the criticisms, Dr. Ketchum maintains her hybridization theory. It is the only explanation for what she found in the nucleus. We went into the nuclear DNA, which is the, the DNA that's inherited from your mother and daddy. And what we did, what we found there was it was not human. It doesn't match anything. Um, it's novel, it's new, there's nothing to compare it with. When you play with these genomes, you can get a, a large number of different animals that'll, that will show up just in 1%, 0.5%. You get human at about 3% on one sample, and this is over the whole genome, not just a portion. Dr. Ketchum's team carried out the sequencing of nuclear DNA on three separate samples of Bigfoot. The three samples of nuclear DNA present the same characteristics, mixing human, animal, and an unknown primate in one and the same genetic heritage. For her, it is the definitive proof, which cryptozoologists have been waiting for, that an unknown primate exists in North America. But most geneticists read the results in a different way and question the very nature of the Bigfoot samples. The samples they have were collected in nature, on trees, on the ground, and then they were picked up by humans. So it is highly likely that the DNA that is on this sample belongs to different species. It is difficult to analyze a sample in these conditions. In the end, you just end up with one big soup with different types of there are bacteria and there are other mammals. Perhaps the basic sample belonged to a mammal that is not Bigfoot. What conclusions can one draw from this genetic study? Was this new DNA damaged? And did it accidentally contain the DNA of several species? Or has Dr. Ketchum finally managed to obtain Yeti DNA? Impossible to say for sure without having an irrefutable reference sample. If you're going to say that you're comparing sample X to Bigfoot, <laughs> what does that mean? We don't have a Bigfoot reference sample. We don't have Sasquatch DNA. The best you can do is say, this is an unknown sample, and either it matches you know, elk, deer, bear, or humans, or it doesn't. 
Genetics clearly isn't an appropriate tool for discovering such a species, because to be able to say that a genetic element comes from a specific species, that species has to have been previously studied. So DNA is only useful in identifying an already established species. The Yeti race continues. In November 2013, Oxford and Lausanne announced their first results. They did not find an unknown primate in the Himalayas, but a polar bear. That doesn't mean the Yeti doesn't exist. We're dealing with the realm of beliefs here. People want to believe in the Yeti. If they do, fair enough. But beyond that field, I'm going to attempt to remain in the purely scientific field, in this analysis and in the way it's interpreted. But the Yeti is still a subject of study quite unlike any other. Contrary to the promise that no information will be available before the publication of a scientific article, the results were announced via the press amid great fanfare. And they are genetically identical to a polar bear. A polar bear in the Himalayas. How to explain the presence among the world's highest mountains of a species of bear that is only adapted to life on the ice flows of the north. Once again, the hypothesis of a strange hybrid being unknown to science is put forward. It's as though the updated DNA obliged researchers to invent another mysterious creature in the Himalayas. One enigma replaces another. Genetics is clearly not the tool that will reveal the truth on the Yeti. And so DNA joins the list of insufficient proofs. Along with the examination of hair under the microscope, the study of footprints that could have been man-made, and the gathering of personal accounts that could have been fabricated. Futile, too, are the photos and videos, taken day and night, all considered to be hoaxes. None of these elements will ever be able to prove the existence of a wild man. Indeed, if the wild man is a creature in flesh and blood, the only way for him to rise up out of the realm of legend is to leave the woods and give himself up. Because until today, no real Yeti, dead or alive, has ever been discovered. What's still missing is the holotype, the reference model the experts need. Without this specimen to study, our hidden cousin the Yeti will remain a myth forevermore. People are seeing them, but we haven't got a body. I'm sorry it's taken as long as this and we still haven't got there. But I think we will. In science, it's impossible to prove the absence of something. It's impossible to say Bigfoot doesn't exist. You know, people ask me, do I believe in Bigfoot? And my answer is, I don't know. Um, do I believe there's good evidence for Bigfoot? No. Is it possible? Sure.